Hi all. In this video, we're going to take a quick look at how ME262 jet fighters were shot down during World War II. As shown, lots of people have lots of opinions on the ME262 and how easy or difficult it was to destroy. In particular, a popular idea exists that the ME262 could only ever really be shot down while it was taking off or landing. But was this really the case? Well, no, and even a brief reading through some of the books on ME262 units demonstrate the ME262 jets were shot down in just about every way possible during its brief combat career. For this video, we will look primarily at 40 ME262 losses sustained by Yacht Geschwader 7, JG7, which were lost to identifiable causes between March 3rd and April 17th, 1945. JG-7's total losses during this period was about 70 to 80 ME-262s, however many of these losses are not attributed to specific causes in the literature. As a result, the losses do not represent a statistical sampling of ME-262 losses. Rather, these are all the losses that can be attributed to specific causes listed in secondary sources on JG-7. As well, JG-7 engaged primarily American bombers and fighters in March and April 1945, so the lost figures reflect combat against U.S. fighters and bombers, and not RAF types. We broke through the fighter escorts, but then found ourselves under massive defensive fire from the bombers' turret gunners. When we were about 1,000 meters from the bombers, Gutmann's cockpit flashed with fire and his fighter sheared away from our formation and dived away vertically. I think he may have been killed outright, as he did not attempt to bail out. One of the surprisingly common killers of ME-262s were in fact the bombers they were attacking. In fact, JG-7's very first loss in March 1945 was Knight's Cross Holders, Hauptmann Heinz Gutmann, killed when defensive fire from the bombers struck the cockpit of his ME-262. Of the 40 losses JG-7 suffered with known causes, at least 5 were shot down by the gunners on US bombers. This number could be higher, six more ME-262s were lost during attacks on US bombers, either shot down by the gunners or the US fighter escorts. The reason for these notable losses are straightforward. The ME-262 was a very fast aircraft, but the 30mm cannons it mounted had a rather low muzzle velocity. Though extremely destructive weapons, the slow speed of the 30mm shells meant most German pilots had to close to within a few hundred yards of the target before they could open fire and hit their target. In comparison, the .5 caliber guns on the U.S. bombers had a much higher muzzle velocity, thus allowing the U.S. gunners to open fire at longer ranges. As the above example indicates, the ME-262s of JG-7 were already under fire from the bombers upwards of 1,000 meters away, a far longer distance than most ME-262 pilots could open fire themselves. Another factor was that the ME-262 was largely restricted to attacking bombers from behind. Frontal attacks, previously a very successful tactic employed by ME-109 and Focke-Wulf-190 pilots, was extremely difficult to pull off on the ME-262 as the combination of very high closing speeds and the low velocity guns left very little time to aim and shoot. Thus, ME-262s tended to engage US bombers from behind, where their defensive armament was concentrated. As a result, attacking ME-262s often had to endure several seconds of incoming fire from multiple guns on dozens of US bombers while trying to close to within effective range of their own lower velocity guns. It was during this period of vulnerability that several ME-262s were lost to the gunners on US bombers. Therefore, despite persistent claims that the ME-262s flew too fast for US turrets to track, the reality is that the defensive fire from US bombers did present a real and present danger to attacking ME-262s. We were escorting a box of B-24s when all of a sudden eight ME-262s attacked our bombers. I was at 18,000 feet at the time and picked out one that started a gradual descent and a gentle starboard turn. Having run into 262s before, I started down after him, leading the German pilot quite a bit. I increased my airspeed, gained on him, and I was on his tail at extreme K-14 gunsight range. I opened fire and immediately observed strikes in the wing and the right engine nacelle. The right jet disintegrated and I flew through some bits and pieces and began to overrun the plane. I started to pull around. My wingman informed me that the ME-262 had exploded. By far, fighters were the biggest threat to the ME-262. At least 23 of JG-7's 40 identifiable losses were to fighters. As the above quote indicates, the ME-262 was by no means invulnerable to Allied propeller-driven fighters even up at altitude. 
Of the 23 losses to fighters, 9 were shot down by Allied fighters while at altitude, and a further 6 were shot down in combat with either US fighters or US bombers while at altitude. ME-262 pilot Walter Hagen recounts the loss of his wingman in an encounter with US fighters. Once above cloud at about 5,000 meters, I saw six Mustangs passing above me from almost head on. At first I thought they had not seen me and so I continued on, but just to be on the safe side, I glanced back once more, and it was a good thing for me that I did, because that moment I saw Mustangs diving down and curving round onto the pair of us. I told the field vebel on my left to keep going, but obviously he became scared because I noticed him weaving from side to side, then he turned away to the left. It was just what the Mustang pilots wanted, and in no time they had broken off me and were on to him. His aircraft received several hits and I saw it go down and crash. My companion was unable to bail out. Despite these examples, it's generally true the ME-262s were difficult to shoot down when they were flying at high altitude and high speed. It was here the ME-262 was able to take advantage of its higher top speed and superior climbing performance over Allied propeller-driven fighters. However, even when US fighters had difficulty shooting down German jets, they were generally quite successful in heading off or breaking up the jets' attacks on US bombers before any real losses could be inflicted. This fact has often been missed because historians and World War II enthusiasts have taken the heavily inflated kill claims made by ME-262 pilots at face value, which has created the impression German jets were shooting down more aircraft than they actually were managing. Thus, while US fighters often had difficulty catching and shooting down ME-262s during high-altitude engagements, they were quite effective at preventing most German jets from reaching the bombers, which was their main job. The main risk for ME-262s was being caught at an altitude disadvantage by Allied fighters, where the ME-262's inferior maneuverability and slow acceleration made it easy pickings for any Allied fighter that could catch up to it. Famously, Allied fighters sought to catch German jets while they were landing. Yet, despite how often this is referenced, only three of JG-7's 40 identifiable losses occurred this way. Two of these losses occurred on March 25th, 1945, one recounted below. Using their superior speed, the ME-262s disengaged from the enemy and set course for home. The Mustangs were not shaken off, however, and stayed within sight of the Germans. Flying in the lead position, Vindish managed to reach the flat corridor ahead of the hotly pursuing Mustangs and land unmolested. But not Ulrich. The ME-262 was raked by machine gun fire from an altitude of about 250 meters. Ulrich's leap from his burning machine led to his death, as the altitude was too low for his parachute to deploy. It seems unlikely that many more jets of JG-7 were shot down while landing, as such losses occurring near German airfields would have been observed by ground staff or flak gunners, and thus probably would be mentioned in the secondary sources I have. Thus, despite how often this method of shooting down ME-262s is mentioned, it does not seem to have been as common as many people believe it was. More common was being caught at low altitude returning to base or after takeoff. On April 17, 1945, four ME-262s from JG-7 were caught by Allied fighters at low altitude while returning to their base, and though they were not landing at the time, all of them were bounced by US fighters and shot down, with only the squadron leader surviving the bailout. Similarly, on April 4, 1945, eight ME-262s of 3rd Group JG-7 were caught by a US fighter sweep as they were climbing to engage the US bombers. The footage you see here is from the gun cameras of the 339th Fighter Group which performed this bounce. Three ME-262s were claimed shot down by the 339th in this bounce, which corresponds to 3rd Group JG-7's losses of four aircraft this day. About eight of JG-7's 40 identifiable losses occurred in this or similar bounces as they climbed to meet US bombers, often unaware of the presence of US fighters overhead due to thick cloud coverage. The numerical superiority of US fighters also allowed them to pursue fleeing ME-262s all the way down to ground level as they dived away. Two gun camera film clips from the 339th Fighter Group shows ME-262s being chased down by pursuing US fighters and dispatched. The circumstances that allowed the US fighters to catch up with the ME-262s are not entirely clear, but it is indicative of the danger ME-262s face at low level where they lack the maneuverability to evade US fighters that manage to catch up to them. Besides the Allied fighters and bombers, there were other dangers the German pilots who flew ME-262s faced. The aircraft they flew were cutting edge, and to a certain degree they had been rushed into service. Some losses were due to mechanical issues, as one ME-262 lost on March 25, 1945. 
The takeoff appeared to be completely normal, but just before he lifted off, a concentrated flame was visible right behind his starboard engine. The engine was on fire. Von Rettberg had reached an altitude of 50 meters when his aircraft tilted slowly to the right, almost into a vertical bank. He lost altitude and the aircraft crashed and burned. On the whole, despite persistent criticism leveled online at the ME262 over the mechanical unreliability of the aircraft, only two or three ME262 losses JG7 suffered in March and April 1945 appear to have been due to mechanical issues. In regards to the Junkers Yumo 004 engines, it is likely that few ME262 survived long enough for the Yumos to become a problem in the first place. A tally of JG-7 sorties and losses gives the unit an average loss rate of about 10% to all causes on days in March 1945 when they engaged Allied bombers, and a loss rate of 10-20% to to all causes in April 1945. These loss rates meant that an ME-262 serving in JG-7 would likely not complete more than 7 combat sorties before being lost. As the Yumo engines lasted roughly 20 hours or 20 flights, only something like 10 to 15% of JG-7's ME-262s would have survived long enough to reach their first engine change. Therefore, the unreliable engines were probably not much of a problem in reality, as most ME-262 airframes would be destroyed in combat or accidents well before the engines became a problem. Operational accidents also took the lives of several ME-262 pilots. Two ME-262s from JG-7 are known to have collided as they climbed through clouds to engage U.S. bombers. Another ME-262 taxied into a bomb crater and exploded after it flipped over. One ME-262 rammed the B-17 it was attacking, and another ME-262 was caught in the explosion of a bomb or it just shot down. Losses to mechanical and accidental causes totaled around 6 to 8 of JG-7's 40 identifiable losses. Thus, they were a notable, if not particularly serious, cause of losses. While not a comprehensive study of ME-262 casualties, I think this video has demonstrated that some of the more popular myths about how ME-262s were shot down are not supported by the literature. Despite claims on the internet that the ME-262 was too fast to be shot down by U.S. fighters, a fair number were destroyed in combat at high altitude by U.S. fighters or the gunners on U.S. bombers. The most dangerous time for ME-262s was when it was at low altitude and when Allied fighters could trade altitude for speed and close in on the less maneuverable German jets. While a number of ME-262s were shot down while attempting to land at their base, it was more common for the ME-262 to be caught climbing to intercept bombers by roving Allied fighters flying ahead of the bomber stream. Thus, it was not so much that the ME-262s were only vulnerable to Allied fighters when landing, rather that due to its inferior maneuverability, any time the ME-262 was not flying at high speed and high altitude, it was vulnerable to high-flying Allied fighters which could dive down on it. Mechanical issues did cause the loss of some ME-262s, however very few of the known ME-262 losses JG-7 suffered after March 1945 seems to have been from this cause. Overall, while the ME-262 was a formidable opponent, it was clearly vulnerable to being shot down, be it at 30,000 feet when they attacked Allied bombers or at 30 feet when they attempted to land.